Welcome everybody to the damage report on a fantastic Monday. That's right, I'm back. I am in for John Iderola, uh, who's busy being a dad. So much work there, but I am Francesca Fiorentini uh, here with you, excited to take you through a Monday full of news. And joining me, uh, none other, none other than the great Senator Nina Turner is here. Um, obviously, you've seen Nina everywhere. This channel, um, probably. In like some event supporting some uh, union rally, I don't know, Senator, you're everywhere. That's true, Francesca. It's, it's, it is as if you've been track you've been tracking me. I was just in Staten Island with the wonderful Christian Smalls, the leader of the Amazon Labor Union, just really celebrating their victories, and they got to keep pushing because Amazon has yet to recognize them. But that is not stopping Christian and his board and others from continuing to fight. They are a union. It's just that Amazon is not recognizing them, so they got to continue to fight. And just yesterday, I was in. Philly, there is an international gathering of labor leaders from all over the world. And I got to give a big, big shout out to the CWU, a general secretary, David Ward, who is the leader of that organization, the communications workers over in the UK for that invitation to be there. Senator Bernie Sanders was there. I mean, it was a great, great, great event and really glad Francesca to see labor leaders from all over the world yes. gathering. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, and with news from the NLRB just just like well, last week, um, it's gonna be huge. It seems like this is the tides are turning on the bosses, and yeah. they should be running scared. So uh, come to the table, Bezos. You better recognize the union, otherwise the NLRB is just gonna recognize it for you. Cause there it is. That's that's what's about to happen. Um, interestingly, we're not going into that story, but we have a ton to cover. Obviously, um, some sh shooting news because this is another day in America. Uh, we're gonna go into the mugshot fallout, a little bit of Biden stuff. He seems to be campaigning, but then also what about his Veep? How's Kamala Harris doing? And is she engaging in democratic politics that the people wanna see? There's some feedback for her job later on in the program. So if you're here, you know what to do. You like in the stream, you share in the stream. You're making sure everybody knows what you get up to on a Monday morning. We also have a Monday Menace coming up. I feel like we all know who this guy is because we can't get his name out of our mouths ever since last week. Um, but I'm curious to see if you guys can guess. But with all that, Senator, are you ready to start the show? Let's go, Francesca. All Let's right, go. well, we, we have to start out, of course, on a solemn note. But it is another day in America. It has been a while since we started out the show like this, but uh, we're back because it is another weekend in the United States and another heinous and racially motivated racist mass shooting. Uh, this time in Jacksonville, Florida at a Dollar General store um, where a white gunman who had an AR-15 with a swastika on it um, shot and killed three black Americans at a Dollar General. Um, he was identified as 21 year old Ryan Christopher Paul Metter and he left behind racist writings, used racial slurs. Uh, that's according to the Jacksonville Sheriff TK Waters. He was armed again with that AR-15 rifle and a handgun, both legally purchased and targeted black people as he opened fire inside the store according to the sheriff. And just for some actual proof, here is that gun and here is the sort of, I don't know, like childlike white out drawing etched in it. There he has his swastika, of course, because he's a white shooter, racially motivated. He left behind a manifesto, but enough about the uh, this a hole. Uh, let's talk about who is mourning their loved ones and who are the people who were targeted. So um, the, the the three people who did who were murdered are uh, Angela Michelle Carr, who is 52, and Nolts Joseph or AJ Laguerre Jr., who was 19, and Gerald Gerald Galleon, who was 29 years old. Um, so just sending so much love to Jacksonville and to the families uh, of those who were murdered in cold blood. Um, I wanna just say before I could get to you, Senator, 
This wasn't the first target of this racist shooter. In fact, he tried to open fire at a local HBCU, um, the Edward Waters University. So at 1248 before the shooting, the suspect stopped at Edward Waters University in Newtown, a predominantly black area of Jacksonville, where the sheriff said the suspect put on a bulletproof vest. A student flagged down campus security when they saw the shooter because he quote, looked out of place, yeah, looked scary as hell. The shooter then, I guess, was scared off, got into his car and drove away. Um, by the way, there is a lot of history in that college. Edward Waters uh, was founded in 1866 to educate former former uh, enslaved people. It is the oldest historically black college in Florida. Senator, your reactions to this shooting and also just the the meaning of that first target. Yeah, Francesca, just crushing. I mean, all of America, quite frankly, should be in mourning all of the world. Uh, this is very similar to what happened in Buffalo, New York, as you know, and many of our viewers, where again, a white shooter targeted black people. This is very much rooted, not just in racism. We get that, that umbrella term, but this is anti blackness. The manifesto that was written by this shooter was very clear that he was out to hunt black people. Period. He made no bonds about it. He was very clear. And I was very happy, Francesca, to see, well, not happy in that sense, but the fact that Sheriff TK Waters made it very clear that this was racially motivated. He didn't play mm -hmm. with it because a lot of times they play with this kind of stuff when it's crystal clear. Sometimes it might not be as crystal clear, but in this case, it was crystal clear. And again, as you laid out at the beginning of the segment, are, you know, just uh, thoughts and prayers, we gotta go further than that. But for us to say thoughts and prayers to the family and to the friends who have lost their loved ones in a tragic, unnecessary shooting, this did not have to happen. And that student actually at the college, I mean, thank God that they saw this guy because no telling what would have happened yeah. on, the, on, on that campus. This is, as you laid out about the shooting itself, I want to add to that the whole anti black nature of this is also another day in America. And mm -hmm. many people don't want to admit it. They want to say that we're beyond it, you know, that this country is not racist. It wasn't rooted in racism. I've heard Democrats say it. I definitely hear today's Republicans say it over and over again at nauseum. Just because people are out there saying that does not make it true. The entire history of the United States of America was built on anti black racism, the stealing of the indigenous people's land. I mean, these. Francesca are irrefutable facts. And and the point that and and the pain point here is that we're still going through some of these same things in the 21st century. This is what really should gall people that it is not safe to be black almost anywhere in this country. Mm -hmm. And this country, this is not well, anyway, don't get me started on Wamasami. I know we're gonna talk about him a little <laughs> later, but what yes. he did on CNN. I was actually on the panel of CNN yesterday, and when he was on the set, he wasn't on set, but when his segment was playing, I was in the makeup artist chair. And I'm telling you, Francesca, I was about to leap out of my seat, but we're gonna say that for the next segment. <laughs> you couldn't oh, move um, because. Yeah, you, they would have messed up your eyeliner. You're like, but you're oh, like, oh, if I go my move. lashes and everything, I was <laughs> even. I mean, I, I was about to levitate. Okay, right. Uh, but back to the Jacksonville, that entire community is in mourning over this. It's Jacksonville, Florida today. It could have been anywhere in America. It has been at different points anywhere in America. All of America should be outraged. Not just the black community. All of America should yeah. be outraged at this type of anti black violence. 100%. And I think that um, while it could have happened and has happened in many states across this country, racially motivated, you know, we think of the El Paso shooter, you think of the Buffalo shooter. Um, uh, uh, the, like, just it's so, you know, it's every single day. But the fact that it was Florida. And the fact that it was initially the the target was a historically black college, that not just any black college, but perhaps the first to help educate formerly enslaved people, should not be lost on anyone. And the mayor, excuse me, the governor, sadly, of this state should also not be lost on anyone. And the kinds of policies that he is espousing and enacting throughout the state of Florida, specifically when it comes to colleges and universities, on what they can and cannot teach, just like black history, as Senator just clear, clearly and simply laid out. This country founded on white supremacist violence. This country founded on the backs of enslaved people. 
it's okay to say that, we should understand that and move forward with it. But no, Governor Ron DeSantis, of course, has pitched completely erasing that history. I would like to say a few additional words about what happened in Jacksonville yesterday. Uh, Florida, the state and its people condemn the horrific racially motivated murders perpetrated by a deranged scumbag uh, in Jacksonville at the Dollar General store. Uh, perpetrating violence of this kind is unacceptable and targeting people due to their race has no place in the state of Florida. Casey and I extend condolences to the victims of their and their families. Okay, thank you for saying that. And yet, from what I remember, uh, you're also the governor who said that Florida is the place where woke goes to die. And what is woke according to you is learning about black history. What is woke according to you is learning about LGBTQ plus history. So the idea that a white shooter or a bigoted shooter would target those communities, that should not be lost on any of us. But Senator, what do you make of this? Uh, you know, him showing his face in the wake of all that. Yes, yeah, empty. I mean, I've seen footage of black people booing him as well. He should be booed because this is empty. His back was all the way, Francesca, all the way up against the wall on this one. You know, had there been just a little, little, little opening there, I think he would not have called it racially motivated. But he should have went further and just say what it was. It was anti-black racism. This this is the same governor. I mean, you're, you're laying out the list of things that he has done. Another is to his very school board, his state school board, uh, declaring that uh, enslaved people learned so many great skills under <laughs> slavery by leaving out the fact that they were raped, that they were maimed, that they were separated from their families, that their labor was not paid for, that they were kept generationally enslaved. He left out all of that. He left out the black codes and Jim Crow. All of that stuff, he left all of that out. So, you know, there's very little at this point that this governor can do to, to he has not done enough to redeem himself as yeah. of yet. Now, he has some opportunities to do that. He should go back to that school board and tell them to throw out all that nonsense and a historical foolishness that they want to teach these kids. That would be a start. But yeah. he, the, the man is, is special in all kinds of ways, and they're not good ways. But Francesca, his back was all the way, and I mean all the way against the wall on this one. Yeah, I mean, you know, look, for all of these mass shootings, uh, we always come back to, you know, chicken or the egg discussions. You know, we know, we don't know what this person was going through. We know they were racist, they, they believed in white supremacy, they have this Nazi symbol. But one thing we do know, though, is our access to guns sets us apart. You know, there, there is, there are histories of violence and racism in many, many countries around this world. The difference is our access to things like AR 15s is unrivaled. And, Speaking of another state that has its own issues, despite being a blue state, is California, right? So over the weekend, there was yet another mass shooting. This time, it was in a biker bar last week in Orange County, by perpetrated by a former police sergeant. The Orange County Sheriff's Department identified the gunman as John Snowling, a retired Ventura police sergeant. He was 59, he came to Cook's Corner, his target was his wife who was a regular at the bar and he fired on her and then began shooting randomly. And that meant he killed three people, Tanya Clark, 49, Glenn Sproul of Stan, California, John Leahy of 67 of Irvine, they were all killed. And what was the motivation here? And I think we need to pay attention to what is always the motivation, right? It's either this bigotry, this racism or like domestic violence. So uh, the, the, among the wounded was Snowling's estranged wife who he was targeting. He was trying to target her. Um, she was, uh, who was retired Sergeant Snowling's intended target officials say Marie Snowling, who filed for divorce in December of uh, last year, sought to end their three decade long union under California community property laws. Marie Snowling would have been in line for half of his pension accrued during the years of their marriage. Oh, he can't, she can't have that. Can't have that. So I just want to say, um, she actually survived. Um, she, she uh, he missed. She's still alive. But I just want to say, like, people think we're crazy when we point out the obvious about who the victims of gun violence are. Nine times out of ten, uh, people of color, 
specifically black Americans in racially motivated hate crimes like the one we saw in Jacksonville, but also women. Women and people who have been on the receiving end of violence you know, for, for who knows, for decades. So I just wanna lay that out there as well. Uh, well Senator, any yeah, final for, thoughts? Yeah, just for, I just wanna go back to the Jacksonville and the condolences to those families too and the people who was, were in these bars. I mean, this frenzy, people thinking that guns are not the end all. Uh, be all, but we we do act like that in this country. Some people do. Uh, the Second Amendment, the people who like the NRA and others, they act like it's absolute, while they skip everything else about what should be absolute in this country, and that is the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness. And part of life and liberty is being able to go to the damn grocery store or being able to walk down the street, whatever it is that you need to do in your daily life without fear of being gunned down for whatever reason. So that part, but going back to Jacksonville, it, it for me, Francesca, that story is not just about access to guns. It's about mm. hatred, mm. period. And I, I don't want, you know, I think some people are going to just make this about guns and mental health. You know, it was Brianna Joy Gray who put out a fantastic tweet and she just said, and being sarcastic, but absolutely true, you know, thanks to people who do have mental health challenges who don't just pick up a gun and go gun down black people. In other words, it is wrong for people to continue to pretend like that this is just a mental health crisis. I know a lot of people with mental health, hell, everybody probably got some type of mental health challenge in their lives. You're not picking up a damn gun, but I'm talking about people who are diagnosed. Oftentimes when there's gun violence, whether it's racially motivated or not, that is the first thing that people go to, especially when they wanna absolve the gun per, the gun men mm-hmm. or woman, but most of the time it's a gun man, of their actions to say that they have some type of mental health condition. Uh, maybe they do. However, we should not paint the broad brush of everybody with a mental health condition as as gunning people down. That is not the reality here in America. Jacksonville was totally racially motivated, period. To the point where even DeSantis can't deny it, right? To the point where even Republicans are saying, okay. But when it's not so clear, and they have no solution to it. Their solution would be to shut the F up, Uh, but they won't do that. Uh, You know, Put a fork in it, you're done, but they won't do that. So they at least say this, but when it is, when it is more random seeming, right? Then then they just go mental illness. They're not gonna do anything about any of these things. We all know that. They're not gonna do anything about the racism that they spew. They're not gonna do anything about gun control. They're not gonna do anything about mental illness. So why are we even, I mean, I don't know. It's just sort of like a pick your poison thing. Hey, uh, D all of the above. But in That's this right. case, uh, it goes back to absolutely the kinds of vitriol that are being spewed. Let's let's switch gears a little bit cuz we got to you know there's more fallout from the mugshot the other shot heard around the world sorry this is that was a terrible segue cancel me right now let's talk about a mugshot um, instead of shootings, there we go. That's a better segue. Oh God Francesca, you're doing fine. <sighs> Sweat beating down my brow. Let's go to this. There are kind of two different types of mugshots that go out there in the world. There's the Tiger Woods, Bill Cosby, pathetic yeah. figure mugshot. And then there's the mugshots that you see of people like Frank Sinatra when yeah. he was young or Janis Joplin. And these mugshots, which include people like MLK, these project a different image, not sad and pathetic, but an image of defiance. And I think that what you're seeing right there is defiance. And that's the exact message that Trump wants to convey. Oh yeah, there's you know there's two types of mug shots. There's this really hot mug shots, and then there's a not hot mug shots, uh, and then there's MLK. Which if we can't miss an opportunity to make sure we compare Donald Trump to Martin Luther King Jr. Um, so, which is the only thing is that they both have a J somewhere in their names, uh, but. Obviously, this is all fallout from last week's booking in Fulton County of prisoner P01135809, AKA the 45th president of the United States, Donald Trump. And in case you were wondering, you have the mug shot again, there he was. And But that that wasn't all that Fox News had to offer. They weren't just saying that he was like MLK. Jesse Waters took it a little bit farther, take a look. Judge, and I say this with a unblemished record of heterosexuality, he looks good. 
and and he looks hard. <laughs> and why would you think that you wouldn't practice the shot? Is that a surprise? Of course you practice the mug shot. You only don't practice if you're drunk. He looks good, and I have an unblemished record of heterosexuality. Oh gosh, so much cringe, Senator. The most cringe. But there they are. I mean, honestly, he looks hard. It feels like Jesse Waters might be hard. I'm sorry, people, I apologize. But there they are, they're just fawning over him. What can they do? He looks great, he's incredible, we love him. This is not a sad mugshot, this is a good mugshot. Your thoughts? Only in an alternative universe would you find people glorifying mugshots. Now, if these were, if that was a mugshot of President Barack oh. Hussein Obama, do you think they would be glorifying the mugshot? Absolutely not. And the only reason why they brought up Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Let me remind our viewers that at the time that the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was alive, he was vilified by both white people and black people. A total blemish on the black community. I'm put that in the parking lot. He <laughs> was not beloved in the way that people think that he was at the time because at the time he was shaking up the system. So we got two different types of mug shots here. We got a mug shot of a man who stood up for justice and, and for a beloved community and for the right to vote, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, unions, that kind of thing. The first March on Washington as we celebrate the 60th or remember the 60th anniversary on the March on Washington for jobs and freedom. Let's underline bolded underscored exclamation point jobs and freedom where mm -hmm. the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. gave his I have a dream speech, to totally different mugshot. And then we got a mugshot of a dude who is so self absorbed that he wanted his own vice president to throw the election that they just wanted to overturn a democratically elected opponent of his in now president Joseph R Biden two different type of mugshots just cuz these people are out of their ever loving minds there's no <laughs> other way to describe and what it's also the clips that we just showed the, oh, right and it's so funny that the first commentator he's like uh yeah, you know, like Tiger Woods and Bill Cosby. Not to like, I mean, Bill Cosby, I do not condone at all. But like, okay, two black men, and yeah. then Janis Joplin and Sinatra happen to be white, and then MLK Jr., who has been so whitewashed by the likes of Fox News that, that he's part. honorary white in their minds, Come right? On. It's just like, oh, the one black guy. It's like, yeah, MLK Jr. and Clarence Thomas. It's like, there, yeah, yay, they're fine. Um, it's just so, so racially. Not even coded, it's just right there. But okay, on looking hard, on looking good. And we're gonna talk about how Joe Biden is playing this entire thing and his reactions to the indictments, how he's using it or not in his campaigns. But here was the current president's reaction to that mugshot. Have you president. seen Donald Trump's mugshot yet? Mr. President, are you worried at all about that? I, I did see it on television. What'd you think? Handsome guy. Handsome guy, he got a handsome guy comment. <laughs> and I saw it on television, I love, and this is maybe for the later segment, but it's very funny to me that Biden is clearly trying to draw a line. He's not trying to use this um, to his advantage. He is, and, and sort of annoyingly, uh, in the same ways that he would like, you know, tell Kirsten Cinema, oh, that she's a she's a tough a tough cookie, or like, you know, whatever whatever sort of smart as a whip or something like this, like, oh, handsome guy. It's this is the closest to like a Biden insult, you know, other than uh, like a two faced lying pony soldier or whatever it was that we're gonna get. And I would have preferred that one. I would have too, Francesca. <laughs> I'm just I'm tickled here in a way. I, I, look, it, it it was a clever answer, you know, at first glance. But it, look, I don't want to talk about mugshot. I need to. It, I wish he had a pivoted to something else. Let's talk about the economy. I don't give a damn about this man's mugshot, right. but he didn't pivot. Right. It was clever at first glance. On the other hand, your point about not digging in on this. Uh, they don't want to touch Trump with a 10 foot pole at all. And they are making that very clear. I mean, they go harder after they being establishment Democrats go harder after progressives than they <laughs> do after Republicans. And so 
handsome guy. I remember during a particular election cycle when then Senator Barack Obama was running. I think this president, President Biden, former Vice President to President Barack Obama, but before he was president, called President Senator Barack Obama then clean cut and articulate. Mm. Clean cut. And articulate, and I want my white family to understand this. Whenever you say to a black person, take it from me, that they are articulate. <laughs> that that you know, you just don't say that because you don't walk around telling black people that I mean white people that they are articulate. But that's what he said about uh, then Senator Obama. He's clean cut and articulate. So no wonder he would find Trump to be a handsome, handsome guy. Oh yeah, so yeah. The senator didn't have his pants sagging to his ankles. He was clean cut like, oh God, oh God, oh God. Um, but okay, so let, let's get into it this because you know this was gonna happen. You know, obviously liberal, some people are putting Trump's mugshot on their t-shirts, but Donald Trump is also putting his mugshot on t-shirts and on ironically mugs, a little on the nose there. In fact, the former president, is raising lots of money off of this mugshot. Um, so it's no, it's like maybe it's a surprise that he doesn't have more. Maybe he should request having mugshots in all of his indictments. How many? How many we would have like four or five by now? Um, the former president has raised 7.1 million dollars since he was booked on it at an Atlanta jail Thursday evening, according to figures provided by his campaign. On Friday alone, Trump even raised 4.18 million one day, making it the single highest 24 hour period on his campaign trail to date, according to a person familiar with the totals. How is he doing it? Well, there's a lot of begging and borrowing and stealing, of course, cuz it's Trump. But there's also products like these for just $34, you can get t-shirts that say never surrender with Donald Trump's very practiced handsome mugshot. Then you can get a poster and again, that mug for your kofefe. Um, Senator, I pointed this out on my show, The Bituation Room. But when you have a mug shot and you say never surrender on it, I'm not sure if MAGA understands that by virtue of the fact that there is a mug shot means he turned himself in. He surrendered. I mean, he's not kicking and screaming. He's not in a straitjacket. He's not handcuffed. He's there by his own free will. He surrendered. And by the way, it's the fourth time he surrendered. So I'm not sure what we're talking about here, never surrender. You and I are on the same page. I put out a, a similar tweet. Yeah. <laughs> but you did surrender. Okay, do you understand? <laughs> Look, we can't make this stuff up. This is gonna be, uh, uh, there's gonna be a lot of nice movies that come out uh, behind all this uh, once once the strike, the writer strikes are, are over and, and then and they, and they, and they, and SAG after, get paid what they deserve. But yeah, they did, uh, he did surrender. So, you know, but in Trump's world, this all makes a whole lot of sense. Back to the point that he is raising money. Look, Donald J. Trump, yeah, I don't agree with his policies. I don't agree with, you know, much like 99.9% .9 of what this man has done and what he is doing. Politically, however, I just put on my commentator hat and just pure mm -hmm. politics. Mm -hmm. Donald J. Trump is playing pure, unadulterated politics here, and he is winning. Mm -hmm. He is winning in the polls among Democratic voters. It doesn't matter what the never Donald Trump uh, Republicans have to say, the man is winning and he is dominating. And he is winning and the Democrats better get a clue and they better get one real quick. That this man is a runaway freight train and he is running away. With the public opinion, you know, people may say one thing to pollsters, oh, they won't vote for somebody that's been convicted. But it is very clear in the polling among them, uh, uh, GOP voters, Republican voters, that this man is dominating the field, bar none, and the way that he is able to take this something that would have just crushed the average person. Right. This man is, he gets stronger, Francesca, every single time something like this happens. Yeah, this man gets stronger and he's raising a lot of money. And ultimately, it is the be, blob. He's Sorry. gonna be a living martyr. Uh, this this is what's gonna happen here uh, if people don't get a clue and stop playing games with Donald J. Trump. And I'm not talking about the convictions and all of that. What's happening in the legal? Let, let the man have his day in court. I'm just talking about on the pure political side. Sure, you got Democrats who who playing games in the same way they did in 2016. They took this man for granted. 
Uh, the Clinton campaign wanted him to be the nominee because they thought that he would be the easier person to beat. Huh. And here, here we are, right? Well, and the same well, thing, if the Democrats don't get a clue real quick, the same thing could happen in 2024. Don't play with this man. 100% underlining that. I mean, we're gonna talk about that in a little bit, but I just wanted to also, you know, to your point, this doesn't talk about his electability, but but people do agree. Yeah, yeah, he committed crimes. So this is broadly not just Republicans, but more than three in five Americans believe Donald Trump has committed a crime, including independence by 49 points. Nine in 10 Democrats and nearly three in 10 Republicans. Okay, not, a, not great. Um, roughly seven in 10 Americans, including similar uh, shares among Independents believe that the indictments brought so far against Trump are serious. About 60% say the same about whether they are legitimate investigations compared to just two in five who say they are witch hunts. So again, Americans seem to think these are he did commit crimes and they're serious crimes, which bodes well, I think, in the general, for sure. In terms of the Republican primary, it is a runaway. It's even more of a runaway now, but this definitely tells us that he, you know, it doesn't tell us whether they would still vote for him. It tells us, though, that if the alternative, which seems to be Biden at this point, is not going to combat this more strongly, it doesn't really matter whether they think that he was committed of a serious crime. Because if he's still offering the same old, you know, poo poo platter of xenophobia and build the wall and I'll bring jobs. They might as well throw down with him. So who knows? It doesn't really say whether it's about electability, Senator. So and Francesco, just one other point. Don't forget. I mean, we just watched paint dry uh, last week with the GOP debate, mm -hmm. in which President, former President Donald J. Trump was not on that stage. But when the moderators asked the question, if in fact President Trump becomes the Republican nominee, who who among you would vote for him? Right. The majority of the people on that stage raised their hands, even the ones who kind of half heartedly raised their hands, they raised their hands. And DeSantis, who, you know, just really showed that he is no leader at all as he looked around to see who else was raising their hand before he raised his hand. But the bottom line is that those folks said that they would support him as the GOP nominee if that became yep. the reality. Okay, well, if you have dragons, I'm pretty sure those are the ones who are gonna be enacting the justice for you. Anyway, I'm not gonna, okay, the bumper's great. I'm not critiquing the bumper. But if you guys don't know how it works, which I guess I clearly don't, we lay out evidence and then we each rule. Senator Turner and I will both rule on what we think and you all can rule about, uh, about this issue. And before us today is whether or not Donald Trump should be barred from running for president. That based on the 14th Amendment of the Constitution, which is the disqualification clause, which, if you don't know, states that, quote, no person shall be a senator or representative in Congress or elector of president and vice president or hold any office, civil or military, under the United States or under any state who, having previously taken an oath as a member of Congress or as an officer of the United States or as a member of any state legislature or as an executive or judicial officer of any state to support the Constitution of the United States, shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the same or given aid or comfort to enemies thereof. But Congress may, by a vote of two thirds of each house, remove such disability. So they can overturn that ruling, which they might. But you're not allowed to hold office if you tried to undermine the very office that you hold, uh, violate your oath to the Constitution of upholding the Constitution, i.e., uh, you know, undermining a democratic election, uh, trying to send fake electors to uh, the Capitol, uh, you know, all that, all the things we've seen. I don't know, keeping classified documents that could that could fall under that. Um, so. Just so you guys, uh, if you needed a little more evidence, um, there's also some aid and comfort. I think we all saw happen on January 6th. Do you remember this, Sot? This was a fraudulent election, but we can't play into the hands of these people. We have to have peace. So go home. We love you. 
You're very special. You're very special, we love you. That could be aid and comfort. Um, now I know a lot of people are saying, well, look, he's probably not gonna get convicted uh, in this particular case of January 6th, which by the way, now has a court a court date of March 4th. Um, so right before Super Tuesday, very, very fitting. So that's just the breaking news on this. Um, but he, it's still, he still might get disqualified even if he's not convicted. Um, constitutional scholar Professor Lawrence Tribe and former conservative federal judge Michael Luddig pointed out in their article in the Atlantic, the disqualification clause operates independently of any criminal proceedings. And indeed also independently of impeachment proceedings and of congressional legislation and was quote designed to operate directly and immediately upon those who betray their oaths to the constitution, whether by taking up arms to overturn our government, by waging war on our government and by attempting to overturn a presidential election through a bloodless Hmm, I think that was the third one there. I think that's when he fell into. Um, that being said, uh, there is a counter from Professor Michael McConnell of Stanford Law School who says, we must not forget, we're talking about empowering partisan politics. Politicians such as state secretaries of state to disqualify their political opponents from the ballot, depriving voters of the ability to elect candidates of their choice. If abused, this profoundly anti-democratic, it is profoundly anti-democratic in the absence of actual engagement in the actual insurrection. Judged as such by competent authorities, we should allow the American people to vote for the candidate of their choice. In other words, it's a slippery slope. If you disqualify Donald Trump under the 14th Amendment, what could happen? Everyone's going to start engaging in this, um, according to this professor, um, partisan politics. Which to me sounds a little bit like what Fox News and other right wingers are saying is that it's all a witch hunt and it's all partisan driven. But Senator Turner, what do you think in terms of this? We don't have to give our ruling just yet, but in terms of the evidence mounting to disqualify Donald Trump under this under the 14th Amendment, thoughts? Yeah, and thank you for that, Francesca, because I'm I don't want to necessarily give a ruling at this moment, but based on the evidence as presented and the, you know, especially the 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 bloodless coup part of it. I mean, we have President Donald J. Trump on record as warning his vice president to to overturn this election, to do what was not in the authority of Vice President Pence to do. He wanted him to do just that. Now thank God. Uh, pre, uh, Vice President Pence did not do that. In that regard, uh, I think that there is some smoke there and it may be some fire on, on even just that alone. Mm -hmm. In terms of whether or not President Donald J. Trump provoked the, those people to do what they did, can he be held accountable for what they did? I mean, that's I think that's where the grayness of this comes in. Uh, my last point on this, People going after people for political reasons, being partisan. I mean, unfortunately, and I'm not saying that that's the case in what is happening to President Donald J. Trump, although there are lots of conservatives who believe that, even people that I talk to who are conservatives. But there are points in, you know, there are points in American politics where we know good and well that people are playing partisan politics. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that's part of the American political. Psyche, and it's unfortunate, but it is a very real reality that we all must watch for. And again, let me repeat: I'm not saying that that's happening here, but it it has happened and it can happen in going well, into the future. Yeah, and to me, I think the people who play it the most are Republicans, and I actually envy the way that they play it. Right? They make a mountain out of a molehill every single damn day. And so this is my thing with the the 14th Amendment is so clear. And we'll I want to go to Jamie Raskin, Senator Rask or Representative Raskin in a second, but. It is so clear to me that this is designed to precisely bar someone like Donald Trump from running for office and all of the people who helped the January 6th and who aided and who supported and who worked with Ali Alexander from the Stop the Steal rally and who, you know, all of the local officials who worked with the alternate slate of electors, anyone who participated in this, they should be barred. And shoe on the other foot, if this were a Democrat doing it, oh my God. They would have barred them from running for office a long time, in, instantly. So that's my thing with all this is that I feel like Democrats are so weak when it comes to even just obeying the letter of the law. But let's let's go to uh, Representative Raskin on his thoughts and what he thinks, uh, whether he thinks Donald Trump should be qualified to run for office. Section three of the 14th Amendment 
presents a, a clear and unequivocal statement that uh, anyone who has sworn an oath of office, and by the way, not just a president, but members of Congress and uh, others who hold federal office, um, who engage in insurrection or rebellion, having sworn an oath to uphold the Constitution against enemies foreign and domestic, can never serve again in federal or state office. And this was added after the Civil War as a general constitutional principle, um, and we have to abide by it. After the Civil War, I mean, you can only imagine back then the idea would be to utilize that amendment in this very case, in this exact instance, that you cannot basically sick the government against itself. You cannot incite a coup, um, f especially from the halls of power. Uh, but anyway, ruling, I'm just gonna say yes, yes, he should be disqualified. Is he going to be? No, Senator. No, that's the truth, what you just <laughs> laid out right there. 1865, I mean, the, the congressman talking about the after Civil War, so we're talking about uh, 1865. The problem here, the challenge is here, this will be a tit for tat. And that's not to say that Donald J. Trump should be absolved from anything. Let's do this out in the court of law. Mm -hmm. But we know how petty politics is is and can become, and you bet your bottom dollar when Donald J. Trump, if he is found guilty, if he goes down, and I understand that uh, guilt is not necessarily the measure for right. whether or not he should be disqualified. I won't put that in the parking lot, but you know the Republicans are laying in wait to do the same thing to the Democrats. And Francesca, when politicians act in this way, that is always gonna be a tit for tat. You know who gets lost? The everyday American people. And that's mm -hmm. what's happening right now with all the Donald J. Trump drama. Every day, my big mama, big papa, and all that they love is being lost in the public discourse. Reproductive health care decisions are among the most personal a woman will ever make. They are choices that should be made by you and your doctor. And the last people who should be involved are these guys. First of all, I'm the one that got rid of Roe v. Wade. Florida Governor DeSantis quietly signed into law one of the nation's strictest abortion bans. Governor DeSantis, you signed a six-week abortion ban in Florida. I believe in a culture of life. If I were president of the United States, I would literally sign the most conservative pro-life legislation that they can get through Congress. Do you believe in punishment for abortion, yes or no, as a principle? Uh, the answer is that... There has to be some form of punishment. For the woman? Yeah, there has to be some form. President Biden and Vice President Harris are determined to restore Roe v. Wade. And they will never allow a national abortion ban to become law. As long as they are in office, decisions about your body will be made by you, not by them. So there we go, touching on one of the biggest issues facing Americans when they go to the ballot box next year and voting on currently, which is reproductive rights, abortion rights, which are of course under attack from a Republican controlled House Supreme Court and states across this country. And so he's focusing on the issues and then using Republican words against them negatively from Ron DeSantis to then Donald Trump saying there should be some sort of punishment. Um, absent was Mike Pence, I feel because you know, like a long sprawling Bible verse is not even, like even Mike Pence's quotes about abortion aren't exciting enough to put into an attack ad. Can we, that's how boring this dude is, it's <laughs> just like, you know. The, who knew Christian nationalism was also really sleepy? No, but um, I gotta be honest with you, I like this ad. I like this ad. I am mad that they're waiting until now to fight. We need them to fight, to have fought. It's been a year, so I want to see some actual movement from behind. It, it's not just when you want my vote, but what do you? What about having clinics on federal land? What about um, stipends, money for people to travel? Uh, to places where they can access abortion. No more of these stories of 13 year old rape victims being forced to carry their their you know rapist child. Like where is the action now? But I didn't hate this ad. Senator, what do you think? I mean, Francesca, you kind of sort of in my head. So let me just add a little yeah. more to it. I won't say it's too little too late. However, 
they had a chance to cut Roe should have been codified. It could have been codified under President Barack Obama. It was not codified. President Biden had the opportunity to go up against members of his own party, two in particular, Cinema and Manchin, who I call the shadow president, mm -hmm. when it comes to doing away with the filibuster. He did not want to do that. So while I will give them two half cool points <laughs> for this commercial. On the other side of that, it is not them doing all that they could have done and that really that they can do in this moment with the power that they have. I mean, they're simply stating the obvious. And my last point on this particular point for this moment, voters are being extraordinarily animated by economic concerns. Mm -hmm. So abortion or reproductive rights can be put in that category, Francesca, and should. It is, it does impact a family's economic well-being along with other things that impact their economic well-being, such as universal health care. Hello, somebody, such as paid mm -hmm. family medical leave, such as child tax credits that this administration allowed to be cut after they touted how proud they were for uh, for for narrowing the, the the poverty gap for for children, so yeah, two 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 cool points. That's all they're getting from me, Francesca. Half Go. points. Yeah, mm -hmm. half. Yeah, half. I point. mean, it seems like so. You know, according to uh, Biden aid, they are going to be focusing on issues and not Donald Trump. So I wanted to get your take on that, but um, crazy. Well, well, right, so forgetting. Joe Biden's reelection campaign isn't going to focus on Donald Trump's legal woes. Co-chair Cedric Richmond said Sunday, the president continues to refrain from talking directly about his predecessor's four criminal indictments, despite saying that he looked handsome. Um, the president said from the beginning he wanted an independent Justice Department. We have to do just that. So we're not going to comment. We're going not going to focus on Donald Trump's legal problems. That being said, on the day that he did turn himself in, uh, the can, uh, Biden's. Um, Campaign Twitter tweeted, apropos of nothing, I think today's a great day to give to my campaign, he wrote. Um, so a little bit of shade there, a little bit of shade, but not gonna touch it. I Look, I see the re, the rationale. If you wanna maintain the idea that Jack Smith, that Merrick Garland are separate, that these are separate investigations, I think it is a good look for him to say, I don't know, I just saw the mugshot on television, meh. But is this a missed opportunity, Senator, what do you think? I mean, certainly, again, his comment was clever, handsome guy. I don't have a problem with it. He should have pivoted to something else. Right. But I'm gonna go back to a point that this audience has probably heard me make before, progressives, real, you know, progressives in general. These type of Democrats have no qualms whatsoever at going hard after progressives, but yet you're gonna shrink. When it comes to standing up to the GOP, and President mm -hmm. Donald Trump is part of that. I mean, this is the same president who continuously made sure that all of America knew that Senator, that Senator, uh, that 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 Senator Bernie Sanders was a Democratic Socialist. Right. Right. I mean, that's it, and used it to the negative every single chance he got, every single chance that their campaign got, knowing that. Democratic socialism, the, the power is in the Democratic part and not the type of socialism that you think about when you think about communism. But they did not hesitate, you hear me, to do that to the Sanders campaign. Of which for full disclosure, just in case there's anybody on this earth who did not know, I was a national co-chair for Senator Bernie Sanders campaign in 2020 and a national surrogate in 2016. So all I'm saying, Francesca, is that it's just a little curious for me how they want to tiptoe around President Donald J. Trump. But right. again, they got all the heat in the world for progressive candidates, whether they're running for president or running for Congress. Yeah, I I hear you 100%. I my my thing is I think they're trying to give him the rope. He's got plenty of rope, and he is hanging. I mean, to hang himself with at least with the general population. I don't think even if they went hard on the indictments. I don't even know if it will work as we just talked about. He's sure. only getting stronger. So what they really have to do is talk about what they're going to do and what they have been doing. You know, sing the praises of the Inflation Reduction Act. Sing the praises of, you know, uh some of the student loan debt relief and make real concrete promises or do more. You know, it you know, it's not over yet. The election's not up yet. You can still win people over uh, and they need to go and fight a little bit harder, but we're going to talk about that even more 
in the aftermath. But for now, if you're on linear, this is where it ends for you. There's still more to come, so many more stories, including our Monday Menace. Senator Turner will be here as well as me, Francesca Fiorentini. Hold on to your butts, people. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.